Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 11th. First up, I'd like to give a shout out to Dave Nicholson, and he posted this in the Dumpster Divers group page on Facebook, and I'll put a link down in the uh, description along with all the articles I talk about. There will be links down in the description box. This is from MSN News. Hundreds of ancient earthworks resembling Stonehenge found in Amazon rainforest. I guess because of deforestation and clearing large areas of land, they actually took drones and put them up in the air and started surveying the area. And they found a bunch of different sites that looked exactly like, uh, in fact, they found about 450 of them that look uh, exactly, not exactly like, but very similar to Stonehenge type of sites. Now, they don't say it exactly here. They just call them uh, geoglyphs, which probably date from around the year zero. I'll just read a little bit of it here. The research was, uh, well, I'll just skip on down. Although the function of the sites is unknown, Dr. Watling said they resemble Neolithic causeways and closures found at such sites as Stonehenge and Wilshire, although they appear to be more regular. It is likely that the geoglyphs were used for similar functions to the Neolithic causeway enclosures i.e. public gathering ritual sites. It is interesting to note that the format of the glyphs was an outer ditch inner wall enclosure and what uh, they describe as hinge sites. The earliest phases of Stonehenge consisted of a similarly layered out enclosure. What I think basically myself, my theory is most of these, although I'm sure they were social places and gathering places too, I think the primary function of all these were just calendars. I mean, you can see they're, they're laid out in these kind of circular forms or semi-circular forms to, to plot out the location of the sun and probably also some other objects in the sky such as the moon and uh, Venus and things like that. Even if you were not primary an agricultural society, if you were hunter-gatherers, but you were grouped together in, in large enough groups, um, you would still want to know when the time of season for certain berries, certain fruits, uh, maybe there's a pattern of animal migration to where the animals come back into the area at a certain time. You would want to be able to predict that ahead of time. And what better way than probably at one time somebody just got the idea, hey, there's a large clearing here. I'll just put a stone or a stick or something here, probably more likely a stone that it would last. And I'll just sit in the one place and wherever the sun sets on the stone, that's the time this thing happens. And then just go from there, you know, put another, maybe something else happens a little bit later, put another stone there. And then they know, okay, when the sun sets in this location, this tends to happen. So I think it's just a, a matter of just um, people back in those times just being aware of the patterns and stuff like that. And then after that, it's just more logical to make them a little bit more nate and go on with them. So it says, uh, uh, let's see, our evidence that the Amazon forests have been managed by indigenous people long before European contact should not be cited as justifiable for destructive unsustainable land use practice today. Yeah, they're talking a little bit about the fact that, yeah, you can't say that these are pristine, all of the Amazon rainforests are not pristine forests, although I still think the, the majority is. Obviously, these cultures cleared large areas to make these calendars or whatever you want to call them. So, And they, they say here, obviously, logically, you know, this is not a an excuse to say, oh, we should go clearing land and stuff like that just for the heck of it. So, yeah, if you get a chance, check this out. And thanks, Dave, Dave Nicholson, for posting it on the Dumpster Divers Facebook site. And uh, next I want to talk about Catherine S. She posted uh, about the uh, doodling pen. I did talk about that before, the three the three doodler. It's a 3D pen that uses stranded plastic, ABS plastic. And the three doodler, actually you can buy it right now on Amazon for 99 bucks. I'll put up a little picture here of it. It's quite expensive though and it uses the three mil strands of plastic which are quite expensive and although it's pretty good quality and people give it four stars, I guess the three mil strands of ABS plastic are quite expensive. So what I would give as an alternative is one called the Soyen 3D printing pen for doodling arts and crafts. It uses 1.7 millimeter and I think you can get better fine detail with that too. But be warned the $39.91 um, has kind of like a, a spotty track record for reliability. People seem to get it and it either works fantastic or it either doesn't work at all or quits right away. So be sure and buy it from Amazon or someplace that gives you a good return policy. And they're also, uh, they make a $65 model too if you don't care for this one. You can scroll down and there's the Soyan 3D pen for $65, which is probably a little bit better made and it has five stars. Although it only has 12 reviews, it's got five stars. but. It's basically one of those things you get what you pay for, too. I'm sure the $99 three doodler pen is excellent, you know, really excellent if you're okay with the three millimeter strands and stuff like that. But, you know, <clears throat> why not try something if you're not sure if it's something you're going to really enjoy or your kids are going to use a lot? I'd probably go with the $39.91 and then if it's a problem or something like that, just uh, 
Amazon's return policy is always excellent. So next up, this is from my friend, um, who didn't give me this one? Let me look up here and make sure I got it right, too. Yeah, this is from Joseph L. I want to make sure and get this credit. And I'll put a link to a video he sent me, too, but I wanted to get the full article here, and this is from Wired. Boeing's new spacesuit may look stylish as hell, but it's all about business. What they're doing now to make it a little easier on the astronauts, back in the times of Apollo and uh, the other ones, Gemini, stuff like that, the spacesuits basically made them look like the, uh, the, the what do you call it, the Pillsbury Doughboy or the uh, muffler or what it's other. You know, it, it just makes basically made you look like a big... Uh, uh, inflated pumpkin or something like that because they were always stretched out and they were hard to move in so what Boeing is doing is making these uh, a little bit lighter weight easy to move in um, just pressurized suits and they even have pressurized zippers in them so instead of the big uh, bubble helmets too it's basically a hoodie with a pressurized zipper and a clear view viewing uh, port in the front of it so a little bit more stylish for exploration and stuff like that not really sure if this is something that they're talking about I've done some thing, things about uh, designs for spacesuits for Mars and they were similar to this too although for the Mars ones what they did that was interesting is they actually used body hugging fabric to where the, the, the fabric of the spacesuit itself created that kind of pressure against your skin and stuff now this is for planetary use this is different than what I'm talking about here these are pressurized spacesuits for uh, flying in the craft when they fly up to the International Space Station and fly back and these would by no means be used for going out and doing any kind of repairs or anything like that outside the International Space Station these are from inside the cockpit of the craft definitely but still it's nice that they're going with a little bit better nicer sleeker sleeker design and last up this is from IFL Science they actually theorized that um, white dwarf stars could actually become pulsars not just neutron stars well last year astronomers spotted a one-of-a-kind pulsing white dwarf now they announced that the object is the first confirmed white dwarf pulsar and it's not that far away too it's located 380 light years from Earth. It's called AR Scorpi, or just AR Sco, Sco for short. White dwarf pulsars have been theorized for many years. White dwarfs are the end product of stars not too big, while pulsars are highly magnetized, quickly, spit, quickly spinning neutron stars. Hey, cat. <coughs> so, actually, I can move around the way here, <coughs> but such an object has eluded astronomers for decades until last summer when AR Sco Scorpi was seen whipping its red companion with a stream of particles. The white dwarf spins on itself every two minutes and has a magnetic field 100 million times larger than Earth's own. Now realize, besides the fact it's 380 light years away, this thing is about the same size as the Earth, too. But it's uh, 200,000 times more massive, and its uh, brightness uh, varies by a factor of four. And it says the new data show that AR SCO's light is highly polarized, showing that the magnetic field controls the emission of the entire system in a dead ringer for similar behavior seen on more traditional neutron star pulsars. I'm wondering, too, the way this is written, and I'm not really an expert on this kind of thing myself, but I'm wondering if it's the fact, too, that it has this dwarf companion, uh, this red dwarf as a companion star, which helps it to become a pulsar, even though it's a white dwarf rather than a neutron star. But I'm not an expert enough at this. Maybe somebody that knows a little bit more could fill me in and tell me about that. But anyway, all the links to all the articles will be down below. Thank you again to Catherine S. and Dave Nicholson for your help on the TDD report and uh, the TDD group. And I will put a link to the TDD group, uh, the Facebook group, down in the description below. So that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.